Amen. Thank you, Mr. Kai. I almost called you Carrie. So, good morning, church. All right, have we got our technology good? I had to bring my computer up here this morning. I had an epic fail on my print job this morning. I'll get all of those bugs ironed out, and, uh, but if you don't mind my computer being here. I'm getting some feedback. Have we got that? So I've got my mic on here. We're good? Is that better, church? All right, very good. What a blessing it is. Amen? Yes. What a journey you have been on. Um, and I want to do, above all else, give praise and glory to God for all of his faithfulness and his goodness and his love for you and for I and for all forevermore. Amen? Yes. What a blessing. Uh, what a blessing it has been to uh, enjoy getting to, uh, to spend time with you all and visit and eat. The McCords love to eat. And I'm going to pray this comes up. And I'm going to pray for the patience of the church. That's funny. It'll be funny if I get to preach with no notes. Ah, okay. I'm going to try it one more time. And then I'm going to just be at peace. Maybe it's the will of God. Very good. It's not going to work. If it decides to, I'll pick it back up and go with it. So today will be an adventure. I want to, um, I've got, I got my back up. I just can't read it. They're so small. But I, hey, I wanted to say thank you to so many people for the incredible work uh, this morning. Um, yeah, the, the work that you all put into the, to the time and effort in, in working toward uh, hiring Avery, a new youth minister, uh, you guys got a new secretary, Miss Lannis. Isn't that incredible? I, I feel the same way. I was thrilled when I found that out. I had nothing to do with that church, but it had been my choice from the top from the beginning. And uh, anyway, and then Avery, and then I get to join this team. But it's just kind of a whole new day. And there's a lot to celebrate and a lot to, uh, to be thankful for today. Several weeks ago, Minnie and I were watching one of the services here at Eastside, and Brian, as always, at the end of the service, did Brian's thing, and then he began to talk about the, the, the candidate that they were talking to, and, and how much they liked the candidate, and how positive they were about the candidate, and my wife looked at me, and she goes, John, I don't think you're going to get the job. I'm like, why not? <laughs> she goes, they can't be talking about you. I think they're going to give it to somebody else. I'm like, thanks for the vote of confidence, Mindy. I really appreciate that. And then the other day, I was, uh, I was in the office visiting with Stephanie Carter. I'm really upset that Stephanie's leaving, but I'm thrilled for her and Jean and, and their new opportunities. And there you are. I didn't know if y'all were going to be here today, but cool beans. So I'm talking with Stephanie. We're having a great conversation. I bet you're concerned about what I'm going to say next time, too. You? you really want to know what I'm going to say, don't you? She's like, I'm going, let's see, what did all did I talk about? Yeah, who did? Uh, all right, so uh, I was talking with Stephanie, and she goes, uh, she was telling me about her history and working with the church, and that she had worked with Rick Ashley at North Richland Hills, which is now the Hills Church. And kind of my thought was, wow, she's going to be really disappointed Sunday. <laughs> and then, and then the other day, I go to get Eli's truck inspected. And I'm going over here to some oil change place just down the street. And, uh, and I pull in there and I give him the information. The guy looks at my insurance card and he goes, oh, I see it's Wharton County. He says, do you want this to be registered in Young County? I'm like, yeah. I said, yeah, my wife and my family, we just moved here. Oh, yeah. Well, what brought you to Graham? And I said, well, I'm the new preacher for the Eastside Church of Christ. Oh, that's where Dorman preached. <laughs> and then he said... Everybody loves Dorman. <laughs> and I thought, oh, they're going to be so disheartened. <laughs> right? And, and, uh, and then the other day, a couple of weeks ago, Avery was preaching. I can still remember so much about the lesson because it was so well done, the, the false summits. And, I, and I'm sitting there watching Avery preach. I'm like, this guy's he's a new youth minister. He's very young, newly married. He's an incredibly gifted speaker, very well put together. This guy's going to go far. And I listened to the more of his sermon. I'm like, 
Oh, man, they're going to want Avery to be the preacher rather than me. So if this doesn't work out today, I'm going to do youth ministry. <laughs> Which would be a step up, okay? Just saying, y'all, kids are just that much fun. But, uh, yeah, to say today feels a little bit like you're playing football and you got slightly concussed. <laughs> and the coach says, well, how many fingers am I holding up? And you go, oh, I'm seeing six right there. Emotionally, I got to tell you, I'll just be honest and transparent. There's been just a world of change in our lives. And, and uh, I'm thrilled and, and excited, but at the same time, I'm, I'm humbled and anxious. Um, and I hope that today goes well. I really do. Um, I have some elders back at my previous congregation that are praying it doesn't go well. As a matter of fact, one of them called the church while I was being interviewed and wanted to speak with an elder. And they asked Stephanie, I think, it was one, somebody for the elder's number, and she wouldn't give it out. But she did say, I'll have one of them call you which was very wise considering this particular elder, who happens to be somewhat of a best friend of mine, and a real character. So Kai was brave enough to call him, and he begins to tell Kai, you don't want John. And Kai's like, well, I think we do want John. He's like, no, you don't want him. Matter of fact, we just found out that John has been embezzling a lot of funds from the church <laughs> treasury. And he said they've, he and Mindy for a couple of years now have been holding wild parties at their house. We just found out about it. You don't want him. We'll deal with him and take care of it. <laughs> so Madison is uh, one of my elders back, back in El Campo. And he, he made something for me. Because when he realized that he couldn't sabotage me coming to um, Graham... He's like, well, we at least need to help you out so you'll be successful. So he gave me one of these. <laughs> Evidently, I have established a reputation in El Campo, and he thought, this may help. This may be the most helpful thing John can have as he gets started in Graham. So there you go, Madison, if you're watching. Thanks a lot. I'll set it right there. And now everybody's watching the hourglass rather than the lesson. <laughs> All right. Well, I want to thank a few people. Um, today really is, it, it's a summit kind of a day for all of us as a church. Um, and it's not a false summit, but it's not the ultimate summit, right? But it's a summit we should all celebrate, and it's the faithfulness of God. Like, like most churches, when they're looking for a preacher, we have a long history of going, well, let's get them sent a bunch of resumes, and we'll just check them out. We'll give them a few tryouts, and then what happens? The church is divided over who likes who, and the guy can't win when he comes in. It's just a really bad situation. And I believe it was Dorman, if I'm not mistaken, that said, hey, I've heard about interim ministry partners, and you all got to meet Brent Isabel, who happens to be a close friend of mine and has been for years. And I said, Brent. He called me, and he, he was telling me about the position here. And um, we talked back and forth for a long time before I was like, okay, let me, let me talk about this. This is what he told me, y'all, as a compliment to you. When I finally came around to saying, you know what, the McCords are coming to Graham. I met with Brent about a week before, and we were, uh, we were in Abilene, and he, we were sitting at the table uh, just sharing some conversation together, and he says, look, this is against interim ministry partners, but here's the reality. If you don't take that job, I am. <laughs> and he says, I love those people that much. And I just want you all to know that Brent believes that God is amongst you. And what a joy it is for me to just to come alongside and play whatever role I can in the kingdom of God of sharing the good things of Jesus. It's just my heart's desire to point us all to the Lord because it is in his name and in his image that he transforms us with ever-increasing glory every day of our lives as we submit ourselves to him and the kingdom of God comes. Seek first the kingdom and his righteousness and all the things that we anxiously pursue, right? That we think are so important. When we pursue Jesus... I'll give that to you as well. And so may God help us all as we continue to seek Christ and, um, and serve him. 
Turn in your Bibles this morning to Mark chapter 6, verses 30 and through, thir- through 44. And I want to re- read this story and share a few thoughts from this passage as we kind of get our feet wet together and what God is doing in our midst. If we go back and see what our God does and gain confidence in Him, then we can boldly and courageously move forward as a church. And that's what I want us to do, because I believe the disciples looked back at this moment in their lives later on, many years after these events. And these events gave the disciples incredible confidence to change the world with just their lives for Jesus' sake. All right, verse 30. Mark chapter 6, verse 30. The apostles gathered around Jesus and reported to him all they had done and taught. If you look earlier in Mark chapter 6, Jesus sent the 12 out two by two. And if you look in verse 8, these are the instructions. Take nothing for the journey except a staff, no bread, no bag, no money, in your belts. Wear sandals, but not an extra shirt. Wherever you go, enter a house. Stay there until you leave that town. And if a place will not welcome you or listen to you, leave that place and shake the dust off your feet as a testimony against them. Hey, that's what I call traveling light, but traveling powerfully, right? Mindy, they did not need two U-Hauls and an eight-foot U-Haul pickup truck pulled by a pickup truck and four places of storage. I did everything I could, y'all. I was like, let's just leave it all behind, except for my fishing rods, my fishing lures, tackle boxes, guns, deer mounts, things like that. All the essentials. But all, y'all, it's so funny. About four weeks before Minnie and I moved, her best friend moved to Grand Prairie. And she loves these antique dustable trinkets. I just saw they call them dustables. You know, they take up space and they collect dust. You know, and she gave Mindy twice the amount that Mindy already had. And I was like in conversation about possibly moving, and I'm going, this is not going to be good. And she gave them all to us. Do you all know how long it takes to bubble wrap all of this stuff? And then times two or more? And, you know, and so we're doing all of this, and so I call Sarah up, and I'm like, I really don't like you right now. I really don't like it, It's amazing. And, of course, I was telling Mindy, we don't need all of this. And she goes... But John, they're valuable. And I said, can you guess? Sell it. (laughs) That's right. And then we can buy more fishing rods. It makes perfect sense to me. No, and so, but we brought all the dust. You think about all the things that you and I believe that we need in life. And Jesus says, look, it's quite simple. All you need are my words and my authority to be effective in the kingdom of God. Amen? And so they're traveling light. And they've come back and they reported the ultimate successes that they've had. The momentum is there. The energy there. The excitement is there. God is among us. The kingdom of God is being shown forth. And, um, and Jesus says, then because so many people were coming and going that they didn't have a chance to eat, he said to them, come with me by yourselves to a quiet place and get some rest. And so they went away by themselves in a boat. To a solitary place. Oh. I don't know if it was like PK or like uh, the mountains of New Mexico or Colorado. But I imagine, don't you know, we're hungry and we just want to relax. This has been awesome, but it's awesomely exhausting. And, but, verse 33, many who saw them leaving recognized them. And ran on foot from all the towns and got there ahead of them. And when Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And so he began teaching them many things. Go to the next slide. So Jesus began teaching them many things. Church family, first of all, the thing I want to point out today is that we all need a shepherd. We all need a shepherd. And none is better than Jesus. Literally, I I read a news article uh, just this past week about uh, some, it says, uh, you go to the next slide. Let's see if I got it right there. I believe I do. Go to the next slide and get the headline. 
Headline, Turkish sheep die in mass jump. Okay? And this is what the article says. First one sheep went over the cliff, only to be followed by the whole flock, according to reports. More than 400 sheep died in the 15-meter fall. I believe that's 49 feet. Their bodies cushioned, cushioning the fall of 1,100 others who followed. The sheep belonged to the villagers in the eastern Van Providence of Turkey. Every family there had an average of 20 sheep, one villager told the newspaper. But now only a few families have sheep left. It's going to be hard for us all. Now, what do we know about sheep? Sheep are, we say dumb. I don't know if that's the right term. But they are dependent. And they follow. And because they're followers, it is easy to make a comparison to we as humans. So we can kind of humble ourselves just a little bit here and realize, you know what, we really are followers. And then how do we learn things in life? We learn by imitation, don't we? Can I get an amen if you agree we learn by imitation? Amen? All right, so you're with me. I'm just checking, Carrie. You with me so far? He's like, oh, I don't know. We'll see where this goes. I'm not fully there. You're like Ken. You're in Ken's camp over there. You know, still trying to figure out if this is going to work out or not. Um, but but the, uh, the, uh, the sheep follow. Um, and just like sheep, humans can go over the cliff sometimes. Y'all remember when the pandemic occurred? Of course you do. It's like, what do we do? Oh, no. There's this virus going everywhere. And somebody said, I know what to do. Let's go get toilet paper. <laughs> and what did everybody do? Could you even find any? I'm like, if I got two, three rolls in the bathroom, I'm cool with that when that runs out. We can go down to the supermarket and get some more. It's no big deal, right? I'm not panicked over toilet paper, which really begs the question, when everything is said and done, in America, what do we value the most, you know? <laughs> a really good BM, I don't know. That's, I don't know if I should have said that or not. <laughs> but isn't it hilarious? Like the sheep, we all go over the cliff, right? And you and I hear voices all of the time in the culture in which you and I live, and it's begging us to follow. I found it really interesting this week, given the Olympics, there was um, Simone Biles. Obviously, arguably, one of the greatest gymnasts of our time, if not ever. And she has a bad moment. And she pulls out. And everybody's in a panic. How can this be? Um, let me read to you an article from ESPN. Um that I thought and found to be pretty interesting. This was July the 28th, 2021. Gymnastics superstar and defending Olympic champion. Have you noticed we haven't got to her name yet? Did you notice that? It's very telling. Gymnastics superstar. Defending Olympic champion. In a meritocracy in which we live, not a monarchy, right? Not a dictatorship, but we live in a meritocratic society. And the way that you achieve status in a meritocracy is by performance, right? And so gymnastic superstar defending Olympic champion Simone Biles has withdrawn Thursday's uh, individual All-American competition in the Tokyo Games. The decision comes the day after Biles removes herself from the team final following you know what happened. After further medical evaluation, Biles has withdrawn from the final individual all-around competition at the Tokyo Olympic Games in order to focus on her men mental health. USA Gymnastics said in a statement on Wednesday, I love this. I love this. We wholeheartedly support Simone's decision and applaud her bravery in prioritizing her well-being. Her courage shows yet again why she is a role model for so many. 
And then I put in parentheses, unless corporate sponsors start drying up. <laughs> it's all, her mental health being acknowledged is only good as long as the funds are there. I might suge suggest this morning that maybe she wants to be human. And maybe she's telling everybody else, I can't live up to the God status that you have granted me. And I'm rejecting that. And I just want to be. Isn't it interesting that you and I will objectify people, objects, and define them by what they do rather than who they are? And the glorious scriptures of the Bible tell us right from the beginning about your value. And you know what it is? You are made in God's image. God's image! And all the commercials on the Olympics right now are about all of the young people being like fill in the blank of all the greats. And we can start you off here, but you'll be like do you see when Jesus looked at the crowd and he said they were sheep without a shepherd? They were following all kinds. We have our voices, people that claim ultimate authority, and this is the way you want to go in life. And then there's Jesus that looks upon our lives and he says, I'm the good shepherd. And you need to know me. And then what does Jesus do? The Bible says here in Mark 6 that he recognizes their sheep without a shepherd. They've been fleeced by everybody. All the marketers, all the politicians, all the, all the uh, business autocrats. They've been fleeced this way and that way. They're, she and they're, they're, they're sheep without a shepherd. And so what does Jesus do? Well, I'll tell you what we need to do. We need to form a union. Um, let's get some political status here. Let's uh, have a fundraising campaign. And let's all rise together. He didn't do that, did he? I don't think so. I don't think, well, I know he didn't because Mark 6 says something else. You know what he did? He taught them abundantly. Do you realize for you and I to live and thrive and flourish in this life, you know what we need? more than anything else, is we need a shepherd who teaches us abundantly. And so, go to the next slide for me. So, Jesus teaches abundantly. And then something interesting happens in the passage. He began teaching them many things, verse 35. By this time, it was late in the day, so his disciples came to him. This is a remote place. And it's already late. Send the people away so that they can go to the surrounding countryside and villages and buy themselves something to eat. Now, isn't that compassionate? Like Jesus is compassionate, so what he does? He teaches them many things. And the disciples, they're really compassionate too. They're like, we got a problem. But I really don't want to be responsible for this problem. Oh, Jesus, it's a little late in the day. Why don't you send them away? They can go get them something to eat, i.e., we can then go get something to eat and rest. Are y'all seeing this? They're exhausted. Jesus has taught, I still have time, for a long time. And I can still remember eating with a family member to this day. We went to a brand new restaurant. The place was packed and the service just wasn't the way it needed to be, but the food was good. And we saw people that had ordered their food long after we had started getting their food and we don't have anything yet. And someone at our table, and I won't say any names to protect the guilty within my family, not my immediate family, but my extended family. Y'all know aunts, uncles, brothers, moms and dads kind of stuff. Anyway, one of them took some silverware and announced to everybody else that we did not have food. Boom! 
And it's like, okay, this guy's one of the nicest guys you'll ever be around. He'll give you the shirt off his back. He's nice everywhere. What happened? He's hungry. Y'all get that way? Don't you see the disciples are like, I don't have time for other people. I, I have some hunger pains going on in my life. And so, uh, and so they're, they're like trying to give Jesus in this great some advice. <laughs> some advice on how to proceed forward so that we can have our needs met now. And Jesus said, what? You give them something to eat. And don't you know, if I were one of them, I would have thought, <clears throat> uh, so just a minute, if I'm not mistaken, when you sent us out on the mission two by two, when you sent the 12 out, I think you told us to carry hardly anything, including bread. So how are you going to feed them? How are we going to feed them? And Jesus says, you give them something to eat. This is good stuff, church family. Because they're about to find out and discover the power of God among them. Go to the next slide for a second. You guys remember, can you, yeah, there we go. Israel. Israel, when they left Egypt, was about the size of San Antonio or Houston. Can you imagine feeding that many people every time they got hungry? You think Moses, before he led the Israelites out of Egypt, Egyptian bondage, sat down uh, and got his planner out and said, okay, this is what, we've got, we, we got to do some logistics. Where's Bill Bundy? Hey, I don't even know if UPS could have figured this one out. Like, how do we sustain the city of Houston in the middle of nowhere with nothing? Go to the next slide. Go to the next slide. So we don't need a lot of food, so go to the next slide. And we're going to, matter of fact, I sat down and I, and I read about well, how, how much food would it take to feed Israel. It did take about 4 million pounds of food a day. So I was like, okay, well, how many days are in, in four or 40 years? So I took 40 years, I hope my math is right, times 365 days, because it can be embarrassing if it's not. It turns into 14,600 days. Y'all, is that correct? Have y'all got your smartphones out figuring this out? And so then I said, okay, 4 million pounds times 14,600 days. And then my smartphone said 5.84 E10. And I was like, this ain't no smartphone. This phone is stupid because that's not a number. So then I got my smart son, who's going to be majoring in engineering. And I said, Eli, what does that mean? And he goes, like, Dad, that's like, E is like to the 10th degree. That's like uh, 58 billion, 400 million pounds of food. And my mind went, my gray matter went. <sighs> is anything too great for our God? What has he demonstrated and shown over and over and over again? Um, and so he says, you give them something to eat. And they're like, well, uh, we don't have anything. He said, how many loaves do you have? He said, go and see. And when they found out, <laughs> they thought, we're going to get off the hook now. We're going to get off the hook. We did the survey. We found out. We've got five loaves and two fish. He's going to let us off now, right? Can you just see this? I mean, can you imagine this? Uh, Jesus, uh, we have five loaves and two fish. <laughs> We're going to get that break now. We're going to get... I didn't know if I could dance up here or not. <laughs> but Jesus said... Oh, thanks, guys, for looking. All right, y'all go. It's great to be with you. Don't forget some of the main points that I said. We'll catch up with you later. Right? No. He said... Um, he directed the disciples, have them all sit down in groups on the green grass. Hmm. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in 
green pastures. And he leads me beside. He restores my. Could this man be like David? Could he be like Moses who taught and fed? So they sat down in groups of hundreds and fifties and taken the five loaves and the two fish looking up to heaven. Okay, have you ever thought about the different prayer um, postures that we find ourselves in? I know we're very used to bowing our head. Jesus looked up to heaven and prayed. It's okay to look up. Jesus looked up to heaven because that's where the resources are. He looked up to heaven and blessed is what the Greek says. He blessed. He gave thanks. And he broke the loaves and then he gave it to his disciples to distribute to the people. He also divided the two fish among them all. And they all laid and were satisfied. And the disciples picked up 12 basketfuls of broken pieces of bread and fish. And the number of men who had eaten was 5,000. They estimate there's probably about 15,000 people out there. It was 600,000 men that came out of Israel. It's probably, like I said, San Antonio or Houston size. God knows how to take care of our needs. Maybe if we looked up to heaven more, what a blessing that would be. Go to the next slide. Um, if you were going to feed that many, it'd take three freight trains per day. Go to the next slide. You needed that much water out on the wilderness, 370 tankers for water a day. Go to the next slide. But Jesus is going to teach the disciples this. That obedience is the way to satisfaction. It's like just, what do you have? And offer it to God. Obedience leads to satisfaction. Our problems are never too big for God to handle. And then finally, number four, let's go to the next slide. And I'll wrap it up with this. When we're satiated, when we're satisfied, it builds trust and confidence in God. Amen? You know, when God, don't you know the disciples, uh, the text later on will say they still didn't get it. And they're not going to get it until the resurrection. But after the resurrection, they really do get it. And then they're looking back in their life and we go, this is the God we love. This is the God we serve. This is the God that's with us. This is the one that provides and blesses and magnifies. And they find themselves in a position of being satisfied. And, and, and confidence begins to emerge in their lives. And they do great things. You know what's missing in this text? The crowd and their response. The crowd is not amazed. And I looked more at that and I thought, Huh, who really saw the miracle that day? It wasn't the crowd, because if they had seen it, it would have been a miracle. But when the disciples took the two fish and the five loaves, and the, the broken stuff of Jesus, in 12 baskets and started to disperse it, they saw scarcity. This is going to run out too quick. We're going to look like idiots. This is embarrassing. I can just hear it. And as they pass it out, and they give and they share what God has given and shared, he didn't ask them to give something they didn't have. He said, what do you have? We have five loaves and two fish. Okay, well, God can do something with that. What's keeping y'all from ministry and service? Well, what do we look at? We look at what we don't have rather than what we do. And then we do social comparison. Well, like oh, brother so and so and oh, sister and so and so, they could do that so much better than I could. And we begin to compare ourselves and we think, well, I can't do it because I'm not as good or I'm not as able or I have, don't have as much. That's not what Jesus asked. Jesus says, what do you have? Go and see. We got five loaves and two fish. Man, a little pack of sardines and some bread right here. That's about it. It's a meal for one. 
Okay, well, I can do something with that. Would you entrust it to me? He prays, he offers to give thanks, and what does God do? God magnifies the gift. And the Bible says that everyone ate and was satisfied. Y'all remember the last time you felt satisfied from the food that God has provided? And when you do, don't you remember how filling it was? And you gain confidence, and you gain trust, and you're like, God, do it again. God, this is all I have. See, the question for you today is, well, what do you have? Like, God wants to take what you have, Eastside, and if you'll offer it, and we'll offer it to the Lord and ask Him to bless it, and we break it and we disperse it. Everyone, everyone is satisfied. Amen? Go to the next slide. That is, there is no other slide. So let me end with this thought God is able. Amen? He is able, more than able. To accomplish what concerns me today. Y'all know this song? He is able, more than able, to handle anything that comes my way. He is able, more than able. To do much more than I could ever dream. He is able, more than able, to make me what he wants me to be. If you believe it, say amen. 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 Our God is able. Listen, church family, if there's any way we can serve you this morning, I want you to know the shepherds love you. Uh, the Lord loves you. If there's a, this church body loves you, bring your cares, your concerns, whatever they are, to Jesus, and let us pray and serve you in any, any way. Um, Kai, let's all stand and give our praise to God.